Captain Spooky. South Coast. Look, I know the supernatural is something that isn't supposed to happen, but it does happen. AM 1420 WBSM presents Spooky South Ghost with your hosts Tim Weisberg and Matt Costa. Good evening and welcome to Spooky South Coast. We are here. Tim Weisberg here along with science advisor Matt Moniz. Matt Costa is still MIA. He's, He'll be back. Uh, we hope. We miss him a lot. If you're listening, Matt, call me. Uh, we are here to talk with you about the paranormal as we are each and every Saturday night, usually a lot earlier. Thanks, Red Sox, Yankees. Of course, we knew this was going to happen. This always happens when the Red Sox and Yankees play. We book a great guest, and then we don't get on until like five minutes before the show is supposed to end, which is kind of the case tonight. So we were going to be speaking with Peter Muse, uh, who runs a great website called New England folklore.blogspot.com it's uh it's a great blog where he keeps track of all the different i mean th this guy just does immense research into new england folklore and puts up little tidbits here and there and it's it's really good stuff i mean it's stuff that you're not going to read on other sites uh he has access to some books that probably you know aren't on the library shelves anymore around here so definitely check out the site and we will talk to him uh next week instead so hopefully the Red Sox are playing the Tampa Bay Rays, Tampa Rays, whatever they're calling themselves now. So uh, hopefully that game will go a bit quicker and we can have an entire show with Peter Muse talking about New England folklore and some of the really cool stories that we're going to discuss tonight. But instead, you get to listen to Moniz and myself for about a half an hour, which is really all anybody can stand <laughs> of us. Even us. Yeah, right. I mean, it takes about 15 minutes after I pick Moniz up for me to get here and usually like... You know, during the course of the conversation, we're each rolling our eyes, being like, enough of this guy already. We have to listen to each other for two more hours. But uh, it's been quiet in here tonight because we haven't been doing the show. Yeah. So how how was your 4th of July, let me ask you? I enjoyed myself. I had a lot of fun eating lots of good food, hanging out with uh, good friends and watching all kinds of fireworks. Some of them you probably caused. A few. <laughs> and uh, I can just imagine you and all the, the zombie hunters on the island of Dr. Moniz every time fireworks went off, just, you know, shooting off your rifles and grunting. No, small explosives. Well, whatever works. Well, I had a I had a quiet day. So uh, but tomorrow is not going to be a quiet day, at least in the UFO community. No, even though today's the anniversary. Well, we'll get into all that in a minute. But tomorrow is World Disclosure Day. Uh, this comes from. The Paradigm Research Group, our friend Steve Bassett and the Paradigm Research Group. Uh, disclosure, the formal acknowledgement by world governments of an extraterrestrial presence engaging the human race is the primary goal of a growing international truth movement. The purpose of World Disclosure Day is to provide a focal point for people and organizations to come together to assert their right to know extraordinary information being withheld from them by their governments. This is known as the Truth Embargo. World Disclosure Day will also help broaden public awareness of the disclosure process and those organizations involved in this advocacy work. On July 8, 1947, General Roger Ramey held a press event at the 8th Army Air Force Headquarters in Fort Worth, Texas, in which he changed the just-released story of a recovered crash disk near Roswell, New Mexico, to that of a retrieved weather balloon. This was the informal beginning of the now 65-year truth embargo of formal acknowledgement of the human race is not alone in the cosmos. For this reason, the date July 8th was chosen to emphasize... From Wareham to Westport, we've got you covered. That's the AM 1420, WBSM. <laughs> Actually, I just didn't turn things over on the computer. So it's critical that you know if you have it. But what makes diabetes so scary? Many people don't know when they have it because there are often no symptoms. Meanwhile, diabetes can be causing damage that will lead to serious... There we go. I don't even know what's going on over there. So anyway, that's why they chose July 8th for the World Disclosure, Pro uh, World Disclosure Day. People and organizations from every nation can register their endorsement of World Disclosure Day at the WDD website. There are now over 5,000 endorsements. The broad-based study of the history and implications of the extraterrestrial presence engaging the human race is called exopolitics. World, Disclo World Disclosure Day is part of an exopolitical advocacy process. Uh, if you go to paradigmresearchgroup.org, you can check out some of their extensive documents uh, that prove that there is a truth embargo going on. 
And I just want to talk to you a little bit about this, Moniz. It does say, too, here that on the, first, on the day that the First Nation comes forward to finally and formally acknowledge the extraterrestrial presence, that day will then become World Disclosure Day or Disclosure Day, historically recognizing the most profound event in human history. So should, you know, on May 15th, 2013, should, you know, France acknowledge extraterrestrial contact, then... May 15th would become World Disclosure Day, but for now it's July 8th. extraterrestrial contact. Yes. yes. Okay, I see. But there have been many governments that have already uh, expressed that they believe that there is stuff out there. Well, this is, this is formal, full-out disclosure, not just, you know, releasing documents and, and, and having them available for the public viewing. They're talking full-out... You know, the leader of yeah. that country standing there and acknowledging that, yes, there is an alien presence well, you can and, yes, go we back. have had contact. You can go back in time uh, before we actually invaded the country. The president of Grenada, uh, after a series of UFO events over that small country, uh, actually got the UN to, you know, formally look into things. And he uh, said f- wholeheartedly that he believed that there was stuff there. I mean... A couple of years later, we're invading and bombing his country, but and, and, but was he speaking? Um, was he p- speaking from his personal belief, or was he speaking from a, no, as a, a leader, a governmental of, standpoint? As because a governmental standpoint, the former Canadian defense minister has come forward and said that he believes that there is, uh, you know, an extraterrestrial presence, but he wasn't speaking uh, on behalf of the government. There's a difference between, you know, Bill Clinton saying, "Yeah, I think aliens are real." And no, between Bill went, Clinton standing there went and... before the U.N. and petitioned them to look at it. I mean, at, in, in an official stance. This was back in the late 70s, early 80s. Mm-hmm. I missed that part in Heartbreak Ridge. <laughs> Great movie, by the way. Yeah, it is. But uh, So tomorrow will be World Disclosure Day, and that becomes, uh, you know, that's become the date that's recognized because of uh, the Roswell incident and the disclosure of the Roswell incident being on July 8th. So we were talking back and forth about the chain of events leading up to No, that would be the up closure of the... Well, yeah, the, the disinformation disclosure of the Roswell events. But, uh, you know, we are here on, on the anniversary, so this would be the uh, 65th anniversary. And, uh, of course, we talked on the 60th anniversary uh, with uh, Dr. Jesse Marcel Jr. And, and uh, we... I was there. <laughs> yeah, we, we've had... Numerous episodes about Roswell in the past. Of course, the Roswell Smackdown, which was a, another great episode. And I don't think you're just wearing that episode, that T-shirt today for the Roswell UFO Festival by accident. I think it was planned because it was the only clean shirt you had left. Why can't it be both? <laughs> why, why does it have to be clean? Who said it was? So, but, I mean, this is something that we've, we've discussed in, in numerous uh, shows over the years. But basically, you know, we're not buying the weather balloon explanation. No, or the mogul balloon, or the testing of various other um, whatever secret, you know, atomic things that they were testing. I mean, there's more theories than you can shake a stick at. Well, I'd like to to broaden this a little bit more than what we usually discuss. I mean, both of us do believe that there was a crash of some kind that was not a weather balloon. Correct. Correct. Do we believe that it was an extraterrestrial craft that crashed? Uh, uh, extraterrestrial is um, a nebulous term. Was it something it, not of this world, or was it something that we weren't supposed to know about, and therefore there had to be spin on it and it had to become the weather balloon because, you know, it was... It was something definitely that's unknown to us. Mm-hmm. Do you want to call it alien? It, you can use the term alien, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it came from, you know, a, a star system beyond our own. Could it have been, you know, say some other country's craft that we weren't supposed to know had access to our airspace? Could it have been, you know, the forerunner of the U-2 spy plane or something and they didn't want to get the information out there? I mean, could it have been something man-made that we were just trying to put a spin on? I think it could have been something man-made, but not from the time period that it was found in. Let's okay. put it that and way. I, I see where you're going with that. And then the other aspect of it is that there was, uh, there was recently uh, somebody who spoke out, I believe in, I want to say March or May, uh, who was the former CIA liaison to the entertainment industry. And his name escapes me right now. But he had actually come forward and said that 
uh, not only was there a crash in which they retrieved pieces of an alien spacecraft, and by alien I mean none of this world, but there was also the recovery of bodies from that crash, uh, cadavers, dead bodies from that crash. You've done a lot more research into this than I have, and, and with Talked yourself. Talked to some and, of the people that handled both the bodies and the material. So there were bodies. Yes. Uh, and, and the bodies were not of human origin? They did not appear to be human or human as we understand them. Okay. What, what would be the basis for that? What would be the reason why they made that determination? According to, well, this also comes, like I said, not just from the people I talked to personally, but from uh, all of the written material about sure. the recovered bodies. I'm drawing on your wealth of knowledge okay. as somebody who studied this. <laughs> okay. Uh, the consensus is that they were definitely, you know, three and a half to four feet tall, uh, very slender build, uh, childlike almost in, in appearance. Their coloring was uh, a multitude of colors. One of the common descriptions of them is actually not gray, but more of a salmon colored or a uh, pinkish hue to them with flecks of gray in it, similar to how a salmon looks. Mm -hmm. Salmon look something like, like that. That scaly That's, aspect of the... Wasn't scaly. Not, not the scaly, but like the, um, you know, almost like you can see the... The pieces in it almost like uh, what's pearlescent almost. In yeah. It? Yeah. Like shimmery yeah. almost in its appearance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, pink was one of the predominant colors that was explained to me as the main base tone. And there were several, you know, shadings of gray through it. The gray flecks. Now, is that a result of, you know, the crash and the That's body so changing? Thinking, you could know, it have been exposure to heat from the crash. Yeah. Or? Could have been, could have been exposure yet. to our atmosphere if it wasn't their their normal atmosphere. Right. I mean, a human body will turn different colors, you know, blue and whatever, if you don't get enough oxygen. These things, if exposed to oxygen, probably could have turned this pink color as a reaction to mm -hmm. our atmosphere. Yeah, we don't know. That's just speculation. But, yeah, they were definitely diminutive in size. They were definitely... Um, they had arms and legs and a head. They were shaped similar to us, so you could say they were humanoid, mm -hmm. as was the description. Large heads, large eyes, long slender fingers, and uh, their f hands were definitely different than ours. It was one of the other things that was uh, repeatedly different expressive. in terms of the way the way they jointed in the way they there were um, things on the end of their fingers, combination between claws and other little things. And Same number of digits? No, different number of digits. Different lengths of the fingers as well. Did one of them glow and heal you? Mm, and not the, not that I was told. Yeah. But, uh, and, and poke fun, but we, we really haven't had, you and I, a philosophical discussion about the nature of alien beings because I respect your work that you've done okay. in the field and I respect uh, it's probably a loaded question too with 20 minutes left in the show <laughs> but uh, I, 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 I firmly believe in the work that you've done from a scientific point of view and I, I don't question the fact that people are seeing these things that these things do exist I do question whether or not they are from another planet I, I'm not going to argue that point because I have no proof myself that they are. I'm mm -hmm. dealing with what I got from history to read from and from what I know from talking to the firsthand people that were there. Not, oh, my mother's cousin's brother said that they said, no, I went and talked to dozens of people while they were still alive that actually handled the material. I heard from the horse's mouth that saw it themselves. So. But the the common belief out there the the more popular belief is that these beings are creatures from another planet and with that in mind i i ask you is it necessary then if they are coming from another galaxy do they have to be humanoid in appearance i mean are, are we is that almost to some degree kind of our own ego well, getting into the description of, of alien beings? Well, we're an egocentric species. Mm -hmm. You know, we think of ourselves as the rulers of everything. I mean, we're not even... And made in God's image. Yeah, uh, and many other, you know, 
what I'll call them fallacies about ourselves and where we are in this world because we're not at the top. Pure, plain, and simple. And uh, Mother Nature has a great way of showing that to us. And that that's just the planet we live on. Never mind any quote-unquote sentient being from somewhere yeah, else. I always wondered why we thought that we were above elephants in the food chain. If elephants just decided one day that we tasted I'd, good, we'd be done for. Put it this way. I'm a scuba diver. I, I'm out, out there in the ocean all the time. I regularly realize I am not at the top of the food chain mm-hmm. when I'm out there. So, yeah, the, we're not even, you know... What we've the, done the is masters of this world. We haven't put ourselves at the top of the food chain. We found a way to kind of branch off into our own food chain by right. not putting ourselves in the situations where we could be absorbed back into the original plan. Yeah. So, but it, I, I've I've gotten into this debate with people before in the past. People who uh, question whether or not people are legitimately seeing alien beings. Uh, people who, when I tell them what we do here on the show and what we talk about. Uh, if the discussion turns to say abductions, they're like, "Well, that's not real. You know, that's that's just people dreaming, or that's just people." And, and they all cite the fact that they are described as humanoid figures as being our own ego that they wouldn't have to be, they wouldn't have to look like us because there are other species on our planet that are able to survive and thrive quite easily that don't look anything like us. So why would we assume that another race from another planet would have to look like us too? Well, uh, it's interesting that you bring that up. If you look at most of the species on this planet, we all form the same basic body type. We may have different differences in those individual structures. That's what separates us. They're known as homologous structures mm-hmm. or, you know, having the same. And, but uh, that we all have heads and appendages, heads at the front, tails at the back. And, you know, this is how we, how we work. And that's based on... That design is based on the need because of the type of gravity that we have. It's used for... Um, and also form and function, too. Yeah, I mean, for, exactly. Has to, your arms have to be in a length where you can control your surroundings. Right. And, and these basic laws of physics not only apply here, they apply anywhere else where you have these same conditions. On a planet that orbits a star that has a mass of a certain size, it... You know, we'll have a certain amount of gravity. There will be a, a known amount of light coming to that place and hopefully to have liquid water for life to survive. Yeah. If life starts to evolve and develop, then yeah, you're going to have similar structures develop. It's just the nature of physics. That's why they quote unquote are humanoid in appearance. You can roughly say a dog is humanoid. In appearance, if you get it to stand up, it has legs, it ha- appears to have arms and a head. You know, it, it doesn't look exactly like us, no, but it has all the same structures. Well, are we not what we are? And this is probably, again, another little question with 15 minutes left in the show, because we're getting into the uh, creationism versus Darwinism theory of evolution here. But uh, my belief is that uh, it's it's possible more than 90 percent possible that we evolved from primates you know that we're basically just the advanced form of those creatures and over time this is what became of us so isn't it possible that on another planet they don't even have primates to begin with so therefore that more advanced species would have evolved from something completely different and would look completely different it all has to do with the conditions that are available to them on wherever they're right so there's a a variety of conditions here that formed us into what we are and elsewhere there could be a variety of other differences i mean the further a planet is away from the orbiting star the star that it orbits the colder that planet's going to be so wouldn't it be in theory yeah. yeah but wouldn't it be possible that some of these other you know other creatures would be more hairy than we are instead of less wouldn't it be possible that you know, these creatures would have uh, a, a heavier body type instead of a thinner one. You know, I'm just saying, just as an example, you know, there's, there's, yeah, the, like we're reflective of where we grew, where we grew up essentially as, as a species. Uh, roughly, roughly. I mean, as a species, we're actually smaller for our size and the type of species that we are versus the scale of the planet. 
if you notice, most of the other mammals that are on this planet are generally larger, with the obvious exceptions of, you know, like the dogs, the cats, and other mm-hmm. other animals. But most of the mammals, yeah, we're kind of middle of the pack, pack. in that yeah. regard. It, it just to me, you know, some of these questions are are things that we never really get the chance to address. Um, I've really begun thinking. Actually, I've always kind of thought. Uh, but it's become more popular lately that the future human theory in terms of alien visitation is probably closer to the truth. Does it necessarily mean that it's us from the future? Probably not. You know, it's, it's not our direct version of human beings, but it, it could very well be that it's merely time travel and not space travel. Could also be dimensional travel. Could Paral- be. A parallel Earth that developed the life that developed from something else other than chimpanzees or mm-hmm. whatever we may be evolved from, if that's your pension. And, but I do tend to think too, that it, it's, I think that aliens are today's fairies or today's the archetype. Yeah, yeah. That's the archetype. Theory. And, and I have no, you know, no proof to any of these particular theories that sways me one way or another. I'm and just going with my guy. You can also argue it in reverse that the fairies were just misidentified aliens. True, and, and that's yeah, yeah. that's what I first came into this thinking. I first came into this thinking that a lot of the stuff that we talk about on the show from the older times could have been alien visitors that we are were misinterpreted through the lens and scope of their time, and that now you know we're seeing it as a more because we're more technologically advanced. We have to see our boogeyman as being more technologically advanced, but. At the same time, you know, there's again, there's no proof one way or another to lead my thinking. It's, it's just going with my gut. Now, this is this is kind of a tough thing to ask, but you deal a lot with abduction cases and people who have had legitimate, solid, real experiences with these beings. Yes, and my, like I said, my particular forte with abductions are people that are multiples, mm-hmm. and I'm not talking just people. I'm not talking about a person that's been taken many times. I'm talking about groups of people taken at the same time. When you're talking about uh, an individual that says that they have an experience, that's all well and good. And uh, I have no doubt that a lot of these people can have these experiences, which many of them do. But you you leave it open for the possibility of it being something mentally um, aberrant. In mm-hmm. in themselves, when you've got you know two to seven people all sharing this experience and going through it, you now leap out of that psychobabble stuff into something that has to be a little bit more concrete and real. Or as the skeptics say, you're just dealing with mass hysteria. Well, but see, I, mass hysteria I find mass hysteria to be more rare than a group of people being abducted right. by aliens. Yeah. Because it's usually one person in a group that says, hey, wait a minute, this isn't really happening. Not everybody hallucinates the same thing. It, yes. we're, we're all individuals. It, like your thumbprint, every brain and every personality is as individual as your thumbprint. You know, so. we could be in a group of, you know, we could be with a group of eight or ten paranormal investigators in a haunted location. And I see a curtain flutter. And I'm like, look, a ghost. That's a ghost. Oh, my God, a ghost. And eight of those other 10 people will say, yeah, they're right, that's a ghost, but there'll be one person I'll be like, no, wait a minute, it's just a curtain. So that's why I, I feel it's it's harder to have mass hysteria actually happen. But So y- you've heard from them their firsthand descriptions of what it is that they encountered. Yeah. Is it possible then that if we are dealing with these archetypes that that experience could still be so real for them or does the depth of the experience, the detail of the experience uh, and the feelings that they come out of it with make it so that you have to negate that possibility and think that it has to be a real living, breathing entity. I'm, uh, that's kind of hard to, mm-hmm. to answer. I'm going to go with the... Um, it, it's definitely something that seems physical and tangible to, to the people involved. Mm-hmm. Uh, number one usually they return with physical marks. It takes something physical to do something physical. Sure, yeah. Or 
even energy can you know even if it's energy it's still causing a physical effect mm -hmm. okay i'll go with go with that explanation if that makes some people feel easier um there is definitely physical effects going on okay and it's not just to the people it's also to their environments other things get affected around them the you know the common misbelief with abductions is they only happen at night when people are asleep in their bed Anybody that's a serious uh, abduction researcher and has looked into this, when you start really looking into it, you find that well over 60 to 65% of people that are abducted are abducted during broad daylight hours. And the most common thing that they're doing is driving. Okay? I hate when I get abducted, abducted while you're driving. Exactly. Especially when a good song comes on the radio. Or doing, doing something of that nature. And a good portion of the people that are taken like that while it during during the daylight hours are also not alone when it happens it's witnessed by other people they see it, uh, is it a disappearance is it a, a being pulled away i mean what is the more most common description do they do they see that travis uh, walton you know kind of floating up into the sky in the light type of experience or is it a, a disintegration in front of their very eyes only to have a reappearance later uh Depends upon the circumstance. All right. Like I said, most cases when people are driving, uh, they get this urge to pull over to the side of the road. And uh, in some cases, they're right in the middle of the road, and the vehicle and all is taken and then put back somewhere else later on. There's one famous case where a person was taken in, I believe it was uh, Belize, and they wound up outside of Mexico City in under an hour in the same vehicle. And it's like, you know, 700 miles from where they mm -hmm. were taken to where they, you know. The only person <laughs> in the vehicle that can get that far and that fast is you. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'll leave that as it is. But, <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, there's been a multitude of other cases like that. Vehicles taken and moved. Or, or in a lot of times, the, the people that are having the experience especially if there is be, the, the person's being witnessed by somebody else they'll see the person literally dematerialize through the walls through the car window or roof or or what have you and uh, they're generally returned in the same manner i uh, i know of a particular case where uh, a person was taken right out of you know here's one of these nighttime in the bed bed incidents where a person was actually taken and i consider this one credible because the person sleeping next to them was awoken or startled in the process of the person being returned with the creatures in the room and outside the window at which point their counterpart you know started getting out of the bed started hurling objects at the the beings as they're bringing the person back and ended that relationship, I believe, with the individual, uh, you know, later on that week. So, <laughs> yeah. well, I suppose then, you know, when we talk about the the breadth and the depth of these uh, experiences that people are having, and and the reports of not only abduction cases and and close encounters of the third kind, and we're talking about or or the fourth kind in some cases. But, uh, you know, we're talking about any kind of, of UFO experience or alien experience. Looking at the possibility of disclosure, I mean, if it does happen, then it's going to immediately validate these stories. Not necessarily. Well, I mean, you would think. But I, I'm going to ask you the percentage of cases that you've dealt with, you know, how many of them do you feel were legit abduction cases and how many of them were just people wanting to feel special or aliens being used as a, as a mental substitute for maybe abuse. You know, how many of these do you feel are legitimate abduction phenomena and, and not just other circumstances? Well, the ones handed to me from other researchers you usually get impaired down already. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying uh, is because I specialized in that particular mm -hmm. thing is that it's already been quote unquote weeded out. Uh, there's been others that I've obviously been brought by lay people, you know, uh, to ch check out. And a good portion of those, I would say at least 95% of those are other, mm -hmm. you know, 
other influences. You know, it's medication that they're taking. The person has a mental issue, or the person is lonely, looking to you know cash in on uh, the phenomena, or this or that. Um, Ninety five is at least is a very um, conservative it's, estimate of outside. I think I already know the answer to this. Um, just on my own as a, an observer of the paranormal. But when there are incidents such as, you know, the X-Files running on television, the Fire in the Sky movie coming out, the Fourth Kind movie coming out, when when there seems to be more attention paid to aliens and UFOs in pop culture and in the media, does that lead to more of these stories? More of these cases? Or do you see... That it's more kind of... There's a constant that's always there. <clears throat> After, you know, the big blockbuster shows and things like that you're talking about, yeah, there is an influx. Some of it is, like I said, some people just trying to hop on a bandwagon. But it, there are uh, a handful is, of other cases where the people's like, yeah, this inspired me to tell what So I there is an happened. influx of what you feel to be legitimate cases too. Yeah, in right. with it, you know. That kind of thing. I'm just wondering what would happen if this disclosure does actually end up taking place of just how many more experiencers might come forward and, and share their stories then. I don't think you'll ever get a government that will actually take disclosure. I think disclosure will happen when whatever is out there decides it wants to disclose, uh, not us. I mean, that's true. I mean, landing on the lawn of the White House would be the best way to go about making sure it happens when the time is right. But also, well, I mean... That means there will actually be intelligent life in the White House at that particular time. Though. No, I think that just means that that was like, they knew that that was the place to make land. I'm not, I'm not saying that they're picking, you know, the U.S. over any other country or any, any other leader, but uh, one, one of the things that I, I think has probably happened over the course of time is there probably have been some leaders in the past that want to stand up and be the one to say... You know, yes, UFOs are real. Aliens are real. We do have the proof. And I, I think that they've been held back either for reasons of national security, because of the truth embargo that the Paradigm Research Group discusses, or maybe just because their particular government didn't have enough evidence to back that up. I think it has more to do with um, the governments wanting to maintain control of what little information they actually do have. Mm -hmm. And governments, whether it's ours or any other around the world, do not want to show to their people that they are ignorant about things. Or that they're helpless yeah. against it either. All right, well, that does it for tonight's show. Happy World Disclosure Day, everybody. <laughs> That's a little bit of a taste to get you talking uh, as we head into World Disclosure Day tomorrow. We'll be back next week. Uh, hopefully for a full show with folklorist Peter Muse to talk about New England folklore. Uh, and, of course, if you've missed any episodes of the show, you can always check out the archives through iTunes and wherever else you can find podcasts. Working on getting all the video uh, archives up to date uh, on YouTube.com slash Spooky South Coast where we have the in-studio video from Spooky TV up there. Just having some problems every time I'm downloading them and trying to re-upload them and comes out sounding like Alvin and the Chipmunks. Mm -hmm. Got to figure out what the problem is with that. But when we do, we'll have those all updated as well. Stay tuned during the week on Spooky TV Tuesday nights. We have Spirit Connections at 9. Uh, I'm sorry, at 8, from 8 to 9 on Spooky TV Tuesdays. And then on Wednesdays at 10 o'clock, we have Spooky Crossroads with uh, myself and Chris Balzano. So be sure to tune in for those as well. Fully interactive programs where you can join in, in the chat room and check out for yourself. We will be back next Saturday night whenever the Red Sox wrap up, hopefully right at 10 o'clock Eastern time. But if not, uh, we will be on immediately following the post game. So until next week, for Matt Moniz, for Matt Costa, for Chris Balzano, I'm Tim Weisberg, and we want you all to stay spooktacular. A Cushnet, Fairhaven, Dartmouth, and New Bedford. We've got you covered. AM 1420, WBSM.